IMF is one of the world's leading sources of expertise and advice on government budgets and finances. Right now, governments around the world face enormous fiscal challenges, but they must also take action to slow climate change and address pressing social needs. Reducing subsidies for energy can help countries tackle all these problems. Cutting subsidies will slow climate change by helping reduce energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. And it will save governments money and allow them to spend more on programs to help the poor. Take energy subsidies, for instance. Not only do they hurt the planet, but they help the rich at the expense of the poor. Just how large are energy subsidies and why are they a problem? In 2011, they equaled about $2 trillion, which is nearly 8.5% of total public revenues. Nearly all countries in the world subsidize energy, including the advanced economies. Subsidies are especially large in oil exporting countries. There are many adverse consequences from subsidizing energy. First, keeping energy prices artificially low prevents investment in the energy sector. Low and subsidized prices make it unattractive for the private sector or even state-owned enterprises to invest in the energy sector and to expand energy production. This reduces the supply of energy, which of course is a critical input for growth. Second, energy subsidies absorb resources that could be used for health, education, and infrastructure. In the Middle East and North Africa, energy subsidies are the equivalent of more than 20% of government revenues, while in Sub-Saharan Africa, energy subsidies are larger than public spending on health. Third, energy subsidies increase the gap between the rich and the poor. The subsidies benefit the wealthiest, who are the largest consumers of energy. The poor typically do not own cars or live in air-conditioned homes, and therefore do not get much benefit from cheap gasoline and electricity. In fact, the richest 20% get more than 40% of the benefits from energy subsidies, six times the share of the bottom 20%. Finally, cheap energy also accelerates climate change. Despite all this, many countries continue to find it difficult to reform energy subsidies. No. No. Oh no, I disagree. No. The energy subsidy cannot be made as one national policy for all. Uh, but it should be targeted to certain regions. Like for example, uh, for the remote areas where it is impossible, it is very difficult to transport a certain kind of energy, like for example, oil, then it should be subsidized, yeah, subsidized. Subsidized not in terms of the price of the fuel, but in terms of the transportation of the fuel from the for me, the government should reduce the subsidy, or at least, if the government still, how to say, still uh, like to continue the subsidy, the government need to think how to say how to distribute the this, to this, uh, distribute the subsidy in proper way, so the poor one got the, 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 the benefit, not the rich one, like 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 the, the current time, I guess. But you know, I don't know the, the program of I don't know this uh, on the gas station, the, the car has to put something. That's a good thing, but I don't know how it's been uh, like this, right? Okay. The policy on fossil fuel subsidy will also uh, create uh, more impact on the environment, particularly because of pollution uh, caused by the use of fossil fuel. So the subsidy on the fossil fuel, the use of fossil fuel fuel is uh, actually is contradictory with the policy of promoting good environmental features. And that's why I suggest that uh, the subsidy for fossil fuel should be cut. In the case of Indonesia, uh, maybe the effect is not direct effect. You can see like this. Uh, because the, the, the fuel prices is cheap, so how to say the how to say the it's easy for, for people to, to, to buy the, the, the fuel. So there's a lot of cars, right? There's a lot of cars, a lot of motorcycles, 
that it means the energy con uh, consumption is high. So if the energy consumption is high, uh, how to say, the pollution is going to be higher. So maybe in the long run, maybe I don't know the effect, how, the, how, this, how, how we can see the effects in property, but in the long run, I guess it may have uh, an effect to the climate change. So I guess maybe this is this long uh, chain, but from the fuel prices, uh, energy subsidy, and then the number of transportation, the number of transportation is going to increase the, how to say, the, the pollution. The pollution, maybe it has effects on the, on the climate change. I guess that the change of uh, the causality. Understanding energy security means the availability of uh, energy for the for the uh, uh, how to say for the uh, how to say for the definite time. I, I don't know. I may, I may, I may, I may mistaken about the definition. It means that uh, a country how to say has to how to say needs energy to run the economy. When you have no energy, there is no when there is no electricity. When there is no gas. You cannot run your country like this. You know, every day we depend too much on the electricity, right? We depend too much on the transportation for moving. So if the economic is not how to say, if energy for economics and economics to, to run the country, and if you can sustain your country, when how to say, if your economy is good and then if your economy is good, maybe you can maintain the, the security in general. So this is the the, the chain. Energy security is the low vulnerability of vital energy systems. So there are really two main ideas packed into that definition. The first idea is that it's not energy security of a black box, but it's energy security of specific systems. So electricity security, energy security of oil used in transport. And then the second idea that's packed into that definition is the idea of vulnerability. And to look at vulnerabilities, we looked at how energy security concerns have changed throughout history. And we identified three persistent types of concerns. The first, from the sovereignty perspective, answering the question of who controls energy. So are we importing all of our oil from one country, from Saudi Arabia, or are we producing it domestically? The second is how long will our energy systems last? And that's the robustness perspective, and that's really are we going to run out of energy? And is the infrastructure ready to hold up to different um, types of threats? And then the third is the resilience perspective, which is asking the question, OK, well, when we face a disruption, how fast can the system respond and recover? Hello, guys. This is our process statement. And we already interviewed an expert in political environment. And they said that energy security should be increased to save our energy. And then, uh, and then even if it is, is it much enough for the energy people? So, this two experts are Mr. John and Mr. Ali. Mr. John says that the energy subsidy should be cut. But Mr. Ali says different. He says that energy subsidy should be decreased. And most of the people that we interview randomly, they disagree with this subsidy energy. So we have this subsidy for energy. And subsidy for energy better to allocate to education, health, economic and infrastructure. And 
Thank you for watching.